Good day. Thank you for attending this webinar. Today I'm going to focus on the SciFlow 1000 fluidic culture system and the applications and uses for the SciFlow 1000. There's a previous presentation which focuses on the technology, the construction, and a little bit of a background on SciCon innovation. But today's presentation is going to focus on the applications and uses for the SciFlow 1000. There are three key features or three key advantages to the SciFlow 1000. There's biological relevance, compatibility, and the type of data and amount of data that's generated from each fluidic culture system. To hit the highlights of the biological relevance, SciFlow allows you to connect multiple organ systems within an interconnected microfluidic network. So you can have different cell types communicating across one interconnected row of wells. Additionally, there are gradients. Because it is a fluidic system, we see gradients of compound, gradients of metabolites, gradients of cellular responses. And finally, there is flow. Biological systems are not stagnant, and SciFlow recapitulates a lot of that flow that's seen in in vivo systems. From a compatibility standpoint, the SciFlow 1000 is compatible with plate readers, high content imagers, as well as currently available dyes, kits, and assays for performing cell-based assays. Finally, it's a data-rich system. Each plate of SciFlow 1000 tells a whole story. Because it's compatible with high-content imagers, you're able to do real-time assays as opposed to endpoint assays, so you can see the story developing over time. You can see the cellular responses and cellular effects as they're occurring in the SciFlow system. Applications. There's three different applications I'm going to talk about in this uh, webinar. I'm going to talk about two liver injury or two dilly, one focused on aflatoxin with direct compound effects, one's focused on acetaminophen or APAP with metabolite effects, and one focused on bioactivation of a panel of chemotherapeutic agents, which involves stringing together upstream intestinal cells and, I'm sorry, upstream liver cells and downstream uh, MCF7 or breast cancer cells. Aflatoxin. This is a five-day study that I'm going to talk about, and the readout is cell tox green or viability. It is a content imaging study. This study works with HEPA RG cells, and the images that you see down the middle of the plate are the images that we generated directly out of the SciFlow 1000, directly using the molecular devices Image Express system. What I'm showing here in this data panel is a time course. It's about a four-day study. Across the horizontal, you'll see the different wells within one row of a SciFlow plate. And what we did is we took our cells, we added in Hirschstein and Celtox green. So you can see the blues, all cells, those are the Hirschstein dyes. The pink or red cells are the Celtox green, those are the dead cells. And what we're looking at in our table is cell viability or the percentage of cells that are alive. You can see at time zero, there's very good viability across the entire row. Because of the biological gradients that are generated in SciFlow, we see a gradient of our aflatoxin. The upstream wells see a higher concentration of aflatoxin. The downstream wells see a much lower concentration of aflatoxin for most of the study. So what we can see is that in the upstream wells, we see a precipitous decrease in cell viability based on exposure to the aflatoxin. In the downstream wells, we see much higher percentages of viable cells for a longer period of time because they're being exposed to much lower concentrations of aflatoxin, much lower concentrations of the taxin. So what we're seeing here are readouts or, or the effects of the gradients that we see within SciFlow. And we understand that the toxicity coming from the aflatoxin is a direct effect of the parent compound. We know that because the effect that we're seeing, the cell death that we're measuring, tracks with compound concentration. Higher concentrations of aflatoxin upstream, higher percentages of cell death, lower percentages of viable cells. Higher percentages of viable cells downstream, lower concentrations of aflatoxin. Not shown here, there was also a control plate that was just treated with vehicle or DMSO. None of these gradients are uh, detectable in that study. There's the same similar high percentage of viability over the whole time course of the study. I also want to stress that this is a real-time experiment, so we had 
Hirsch stain and cell tuck screen present in all wells at all times. So what we're doing is we're taking the plate, putting it in the high content imager, visualizing it, then putting it back in the incubator for more time, reading it again, and just reading it at multiple time points over the course of the study. So with the, the gradients are developing, the data is developing, the data all comes from a few rows of one Cyflo 1000 system. Turning away from the aflatoxin study to an acetaminophen study. This is a seven and nine day study. It also occurs with the HEPA RG cells that were used in the last experiment. The readouts in this case are cell titer glow, as well as there's some microscopy data behind the scenes, but I'm not gonna be showing the microscopy data in this presentation. It's also a comparison between Cyflow and static dosing. In this uh, data slide, what I'm showing is I'm showing a bar graph of Cyflow as well as static cells normalized to percent of DMSO control for cell titer glow or ATP levels. Across the horizontal axis, I'm showing well number. In Cyflow, this is distance from the source well. In static, it corresponds to a two-fold dilution series that we manually generated from five millimolar of acetaminophen down to no acetaminophen. And what we're showing here in our Cyflow in blue, in our static in red, is that in our static cells at day seven, normalized to DMSO control, we see maybe a 20% decrease in cell viability at the two highest concentrations of acetaminophen, but that effect mostly dilutes out and then the cells look just like the, the DMSO or vehicle control cells for the rest of the dilutions that we created in our static plate. To contrast that with our Cyflow data shown in blue, we do see a similar-ish 20% decrease at our highest acetaminophen concentration, but then very interestingly, we see a, a decreased viability or higher numbers of cell death downstream of that highest concentration of acetaminophen. So we're seeing a decrease in viability at lower acetaminophen concentrations, but then the cells do recover all the way down at the end of the plate. What we're tracking here is we're tracking the flow of metabolites. These effects that we're seeing in wells four, five, six, seven are not mediated exclusively by the acetaminophen, but by the metabolites of acetaminophen, which are being generated in the upstream wells and then flowing into the downstream wells and mediating their effect. I mentioned this was a seven and a nine day study. Look at the data on day nine. Again, to go back to the static for one minute, at day nine, we do now do see a very potent effect with acetaminophen based on a five millimolar dose. We see almost no viable cells left. And then it dilutes out across the plate where we're seeing not much of an effect at all in the way downstream end of the plate. To contrast that with Cyflow, we're again seeing a modest effect at the highest concentrations of acetaminophen, but then we see a much more pronounced decrease in ATP a much more pronounced decrease in cell viability in the downstream wells where the metabolites of acetaminophen are flowing, accumulating, and mediating their effects. So interestingly enough, we see very different results between Cyflow and static culture conditions. And in the Cyflow condition, we're able to get mechanistic information. We're able to learn that the effects we see are not at the highest parent compound concentrations, but at the higher concentrations of metabolites or the higher concentrations of the cellular responses that are being generated and flowing downstream. We also did some LCMS work. So we did quantify both parent compound as well as the primary metabolites associated with um, acetaminophen metabolism in the liver cells. And what you can see is it validates the data, it validates the story I was telling. We see our highest concentration of acetaminophen or parent compound in the upstream wells, and then that concentration decreases based on dilution and flow across the plate. We see an opposite effect with the metabolites. We see lower concentrations of metabolites in the upstream wells in the Cyflow plate, and then the metabolite concentrations accumulate, they get higher in the downstream end of the plates, and those metabolites are at their highest concentrations in the wells where we're seeing the largest effect, where we're seeing the, the lowest percentage of cell viability, the highest percentages of cell death. LCMS is a very useful technique for calculating or measuring both parent compound as well as metabolite concentrations 
in the psi flow system because both concentrations are changing dynamically over time. A summary of the acetaminophen study. As I mentioned, it was a, a nine-day study, and what we saw was we saw APAP toxicity was mediated by a toxic metabolite and the gradients generated in psi flow, the separation of parent compound and metabolites in psi flow allowed us to understand what was causing the toxicity. That information was masked in the static plate because there is no flow. We do not know what is causing the effect. We don't know if it's a parent compound or if it's a metabolite effect that's mediating that effect. It also took a longer time to see those results in the static plates because when the cells were fed every 48 to 72 hours, we were effectively removing the metabolites. So the metabolites did not have as much time to accumulate in those wells and mediate those effects. SIP substrates, we often get asked, are the cells metabolically active? Do the, cell, do the liver cells still show native SIP metabolism? This is a three day study. And what we used in this study is we used some fluorescent SIP substrates. There are some SIP substrates that become fluorescent once they are metabolized. So they're not fluorescent at the start, but once they get broken down by the SIP enzymes, they become um, uh, fluorescent. And this study is working with primary human hepatocytes as opposed to the HEPA RG cell line. What I'm showing here is this is a 72 hour study focused on SIP 3A4. And what you're looking across is you're looking across a psi flow plate. So columns three to column 11. What you see early on is there's relatively low levels of those um, fluorescent SIP substrates, but as the cells are cultured for a longer period of time, the metabolites are accumulating and the metabolites are starting to flow downstream. So you're seeing lower levels of metabolites in the upstream wells, and you're seeing an accumulation of those metabolites as they're flowing across the plate. I do want to uh, reiterate, this is only a 72 hour exposure. It's a relatively short study. If the study were continued for a longer period of time, these metabolites would continue to be generated, continue to flow and accumulate even farther downstream the plate. The APAP study that I showed was a seven and a nine day study, which is why the effects were much more pronounced in the farther downstream cells, downstream wells, as opposed to the upstream wells. One more example of SIP metabolism data. This is looking at a whole family of different SIP fluorescent substrates, again, in our primary human hepatocytes. The primary human hepatocytes had higher levels of certain SIP metabolizing enzymes, lower levels of other SIP metabolizing enzymes. But again, you can see that the metabolites are being generated upstream and then flowing into those downstream wells. And we see that same type of effect of flow and of metabolites accumulating downstream farther away from the location where they're generated. The last data set I wanted to talk about, it's that chemotherapeutic study that I want to talk about. It's again working with HEPA RG cells. This is a shorter, it's a two day study, and our readout is cell titer glow. To set up the study, what we're looking at is there's three different plates that we ran in this experiment. There's an experimental and two control plates. The experimental plate has upstream liver or HEPA RG cells followed by, by downstream MCF7 or human breast cancer cells. Control plate number two is just HEPA RG cells. Control plate number three is just MCF7 or breast cancer cells. Shown at the table at the bottom is the panel of all the drugs as well as DMSO control, which we used for treating these cells. Circled in red is this one column. This one column is where all of the data on the subsequent slide was uh, measured all these cell titer glow data, ATP data, was measured in this one column of all three psi flow plates. So what are we looking at? So what we're showing here is our panel of drugs. In blue is our control only liver cells. It's measuring toxicity of the panel of chemotherapeutics on liver cells. In red is only MCF7 or breast cancer cells. So it's showing the toxicity of the uh, panel of chemotherapeutic agents on breast cancer cells in the absence of any metabolism, in the absence of any bioactivation. Shown in green is the combination or organ on a chip situation where we had upstream liver followed by downstream MCF7 or breast cancer cells. So what you can see by and large in most of the drugs, the um, liver as well as the breast cancer cells, the blue and red lines 
are showing values very similar to 100%. This is normalized to DMSO control. So they're showing very little decreases in viability when compared to DMSO treated cells on their own. To, to contrast this, when we look at the combination of liver upstream of breast cancer, in five of the seven cases, we see a greater than 50% decrease in cell viability. We see a large bioactivation, a large increase in efficacy of five of the seven different chemotherapeutic agents that we tested when those agents are first passage through liver cells before being exposed to the breast cancer cells. The liver cells are metabolically active. The liver cells are able to break down the um, chemotherapeutic agent that we, acted, that we added in there, and that chemotherapeutic agent is able to mediate its effect in a much more effective manner once it has been bioactivated by the upstream liver cells. A quick summary. I'm not showing all the data that's been generated on the CIFLO 1000. I focused in on some cell titer glow data as well as some high content imaging. There are many other assay kits that we've also run and tested on CIFLO. There's other dyes that we've used when looking at CIFLO high content imaging study. We've tested many different plate readers. We get customers who ask us, is it compatible with my plate reader? Is it compatible with this plate reader? So we've tested a family of different plate readers from TCAN, Biotech, BMG, as well as molecular devices. A lot of the high content imaging data shown in this presentation comes from the molecular devices image express system. We also have experience with the Thermo Fisher Solomics imager, as well as the Biotech, which is a combination plate reader, high content imager. So we have tested many different plate readers, high content imagers, as well as dyes and assay kits. To wrap up, some of the benefits that our customers tell us they're seeing from the SciFlow 1000 is because it is a fluidic system, they see improved cell health and viability on many of the different cell types that they tested in the culture system. They love the biological relevance, and that's both the ability to, to have multi-organ systems where they have different cell types talking to each other across the row, as well as the gradient concentrations of compounds, drugs, cellular responses, as well as growth factors for looking at cellular differentiation. And last but not least, the, bio, biologic, the broad compatibility of the SciFlow 1000 and the fact that it interfaces with the technologies, the instruments that they already have up and running in their lab really makes it very, uh, makes, it to, makes for a very easy to use, user-friendly system that can be adapted very quickly to an individual laboratory environment. Again, if you have additional questions or want to reach out to us, you can look at our website or you can email us at info at SciCon Innovation or give us a call. Thank you very much.